Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen, interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here's where I get to dive deep into storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and what drives them. Today, I connect with a man that has a special relationship to the ocean. Chef David Pasternak is the real deal man of the sea who started fishing with his father, Mel, at the age of five in Jamaica Bay catching snapper, bluefish, blowfish, and flounder. Has been fishing and connecting with seafood his entire life. As a nice Jewish boy from Long Island, he understands the fishing business better than anyone because he lived it. He lives in Long Beach today and remains a New Yorker through and through. He's notably connected to fish, passionate, clean, attentive to special character characteristics of each individual species of fish he explores pure in his approach with a sensitivity that is palatable, focused, refined, and aggressive. If he were to be a fish, he'd be half bluefin tuna, half striped bass. Tuna for the thrill of the catch, the hunt, and striped bass because it's the king of the fish inshore. But Absolutely. Fish, that is, <laughs> uh, he's best known for his restaurant, uh, Esca, which uh, translates to bait in Italian. Um, in the, it, he, he was, it was in a theater, it's, it was in a theater district in New York where he was the chef and co-creator that opened 2000 and unfortunately just recently closed. We'll talk about that. Landlords suck much to the chagrin of every run around the country. I was, I was, um, I was impressed when uh, I, I found out that, <laughs> that he shut down. Oh, but before Eska, Pasternak worked in two, uh, for two decades in a succession of mostly French themed New York restaurants, bistros. Um, and brasseries all over New York. And, and before that, he attended the culinary school at Johnson & Wales in Providence, a great school in Rhode Island. Uh, La Reserve near Rockefeller Center for uh, Andre Gaillard for three years, graduate de Seoul. Uh, Provence, Boulet, Steak Frites, Prefit, Sam's, and was the executive chef for Tenants Brennan at Pichelin. So that's a pedigree of serious... Uh, driven, wonderful restaurants and great chefs. So um, not only is he a fisherman, he's, he's a serious culinary artist. So at Esca, uh, he got to fully express his learnings of seafood when, when he left Pichelin. He got to wrap himself in the deep culture of the Italian approach to food, clean, simple, and delicious. Um, uh, when, when, I, when I was dining at Esca, it, it was like spending two hours in the Amalfi. You know, it was just, you were, you were enwrapped with, with the best of food. Uh, one story that proves his dedication is how his dedicate, how deep his dedication is, is that in the mid '80s, while living on Long Island, he would go fishing and uh, was known to schlep his fresh catch in plastic garbage bags on the Long Island Railroad to Manhattan to serve them in Esca that night. He took stripers, tunas, flounders, fluke, sea bass, porgies, cod, weak fish, bluefish, mackerel, you know, and then once a while. D. Robbins. Uh, an inadvertent shark here and there, <laughs> and you know, and so whatever swam, he would uh, jam him in there and, and slept them on a, on the train. I mean, that's insane. You know, you, the, the, that's the only person I know that would that did that. Until uh, 1988, his wife Donna Peltz finally started driving the, the catch in her Toyota <laughs> to uh, to New York City, you know, a little sedan. Eventually, they bought a truck to do the job. But this is the dedication um, that has uh, that been ingrained in, in in David's DNA. Every day, Pasternak dealt with at least 50 brokers, wholesalers, gill netters, dredgers, pinhook or rod and reel or anglers. I mean, he knew how to speak their language. On any given day, salmon might arrive from Alaska, abalone and black cod from British Columbia, giant clams from the Puget Sound, mahogany clams, sea urchins and diver scallops from Maine, spot prawns from Santa Barbara, pink snapper, John Dory from New Zealand, yellowtail from Japan or California, red snapper, pompano, mahi mahi, and grouper from the Gulf of Mexico, Sardines from Portugal, California scorpion fish, Ronzino and Culinari. I'm losing my audience here. This goes on and crazy, you know. And 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 you know, it was it was always you know the fish would travel by truck, express mail, air freight, courier, UPS. Most arrived in the kitchen still flopping, you know, you know. And, and David is known for his sharp knives and so many, and that means so many things about him because that's how he dealt with life with a sharp knife, you know. So. He brought the new popular way of showcasing fresh fish, Crudo. Crudo became a name because of David Pasternak. Everybody followed what he was doing, the, the sensitivity of putting a, a beautiful piece of fish on ice, 
on the, uh, it was a glass dish on top of another uh, uh, dish filled with ice with three, with three different departments in them, three different fish, three different olive oils with all of a very distinctive flavor, whether it was flavored with orange or, or you know, or, you know, pomegranate, who knows. But, and then and there was always a garnish and it was always some kind of salt. And that was just a perfect bite. So crudo, you know, you know it was unbelievable. You know, it, so, and, his, and so his, he wrote a book, a great book, called The Young Man in the Sea, uh, Recipes of Crispy Fishtails. Uh, there's a full chapter on crudo in there, you know, so it's well, it's well worth the investment. Tons of creative and soigne pastas, soups, whole fish preparations, you got it. He uh, got the James Beard Award for Best New York Chef, uh, Best Chef New York City, which is uh, no easy task and pretty awesome. And been on done television shows, Sarah, uh, Sarah's Weekend Meals. You know, his, his, his accolades go on and on as they should. You know, he has a rich culinary backstory that started at age five that I want him to share with us here today. So welcome, David. Thanks, Rick. My pleasure. You know, uh, you know, it's been it's been a good road, that's for sure. You know, it definitely has has has, has had its, its interesting moments. You know? Well, when, okay. So let's let's just kick it back to the beginning, then. You know, you know let's go back to your. To, don't think about today, because you know that, that's not going to be. You know, we're gonna we're gonna touch on it because it's just it's a shitty story, and, and you're not gonna you're not, you're gonna come back stronger and better than ever. You know, I, I know that. I feel that you have to, and if you don't, I will just be very depressed. But let's start in the beginning. Let's think of happy days. You know, when you're starting, when did you eat your first clam? How did you find out that ocean and you? were you know for, for stuck together for life how did, how did that happen as a kid i mean you just you grow up in that culture you know there's a culture of like you eat fish well for, for, you have to understand the culture culture is that originally you catch the fish and then you eat it mm -hmm. that's that's the difference so i can you know, i grow up eating those species that you said you know weak fish and you know to this day I'm the big advocate of bluefish, you know, sea robin, you know, April 1st, blackfish opens up again, you know, I can't to wait. Toe tug. Yeah. Toe tug. See, let's talk fish then. And toe tug, great fish, you know. Uh, a lot of fishermen would see it as a trash fish, right? Because, you know, for, for whatever reason, I put it on the menu at Oceana in New York City and I got some slack. You know, some, some it's slack. worth a lot of money now because it all goes to the, uh, the Chinese and the Japanese and the mm -hmm. Korean market, and, you know, they want it alive. So it's totally changed the market for it. Uh, see. You know, like well, you said, when you put it on an ocean, it was considered garbage. And today yeah. it's considered a luxury. And that's just the story of seafood. I swear it is. You know, it's just like what's popular today. Well, you don't care because you're the guy making sure everybody tries something a little bit different. Hey, Taste what's new. Taste what's fresh, and on oh, and yeah. you and in your hands, you know you you gained the uh, the trust of uh, everybody because you earned it. You know you never. I never had a pasta or a dish, and whether it had sea urchin on it or it was tuna bolognese or you know it didn't matter. If it came out of your kitchen, I was excited to to try it. So. I mean the the best piece of fish I ate last year was I was striped bass fishing. And I caught a macro. Mm -hmm. I caught a big Boston macro. Yep. Right? I had a friend on the boat, and I said, right, I'll make a little sashimi. The only thing I had was an apple. I didn't have anything else. So I filleted the fish. I dipped it in a little salt water, and I cut the apple up. And we ate the macro raw with the apple. And it was unbelievable. It was just like, it was the moment. Yeah. It was a tart apple, I would imagine. Look at Granny Smith. Yeah, it was some, you know, I go to the farmer's market to buy my apples because, yeah. you know, I like all those old varieties that have a lot more flavor, crunchy and tart. And yeah, yeah. So how did you, how, tell me about your culinary adventure. I mean, I, you went through so many, so many amazing name restaurants. I, I blasted them off before. I mean, who, like who, who would you consider your mentor in, this, in, in, you know, in, in your career? I mean, I would consider, like, I worked for Andre Guillard. I think, you know, I always thought that was a really unique, distinctive style of cooking. Mm -hmm. It was French, but it was modern French because he was, you know, Vietnamese. 
And then, you know, I mean, I worked with Terrence Brendan for a long time. I think that, you know, that brought that whole, like, Mediterranean flavor to the palate, which... Yeah, but, you know, you, there was, there was, they got a lot of great accolades in, in Michelin stars eventually, you know, subsequently. And you were always, um, if in the inner circles, if not, you know, outer, uh, you were you were attributed to all of that. You know, that menu was yours, man. It really was. Yeah. You know, I think you have to be driven by you know passion. You gotta love what you do. You know, we're lucky. You know, we how many people you know actually like going to work and doing what they do? Not a lot. Nah, that's true. You know, I never see it as work. You know, you're tired and you complain about, it, especially when you get old. But it's still. You got to be in it, you know. I gotta, I gotta be, I gotta always have a project. I always got to be cooking, otherwise I'm not happy. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I you cook know. all the time. Like even if I'm at home, I like to cook. Yeah. Well, you, you are, you, you are. How do you balance? You seem to be able to balance the, um, the experience because you go fishing. You're an avid fisherman, and uh, you have a family. I do. You do. Tell me about your. Uh, I have uh, my wife and my daughter. My daughter's uh, going to be seventeen this year. Nice. So, so you know, I live I live one block from the ocean. I keep my boat one block from my house. So for me, it works out great. You know, that's that's my dream. That's my dream to retire. You no, know, retire. It's just to have a little place. Maybe it's in Key West. I don't know. I own a little boat. I'll go out fishing. Whatever I catch that day, I come back. I cook it, and that's the meal. It's just a couple of tables. Not not beating you over the head with prices. I don't want no reservations. I might want to close tomorrow. I might, I might not, I might not want to work tomorrow. So I'm just, you know, I want to, that's my thing. Just enough to cover my expenses and I can continue that lifestyle. That to me would be ideal. You own a boat now or no? I don't own a boat, but no. I want to have, I want to have a boat, you know, just, and not a, you know, Emerald Lake Asai boat. I want a boat uh, and I want to go fishing with you, man. It's always been on my bucket list. Yeah. I love it. You are like, you know, you, you were standing next to Eric Repair from Le Bernardin and me, and you're like, hey, <laughs> you guys, I'm David Pasternak. You know, you guys, let's go fishing. We'll see who's a real man. <laughs> I, I made him the challenge one time, and he ran away. I hear you. You know, we got to pull. No, we're going to do it. We're going to get Eric. I'm going to do a podcast with him, too. I'm going to bring it up with him and record him just saying he has to do it, and then it's done deal. We could probably go shark fishing or blue fishing because he'd probably be chucking and doing some chumming. <laughs> you know what he's not a bad guy i talk about eric. he's a great guy no i i went to norway and eric was on this trip and i'm thinking north because you know oceana and la bernadam were kind of you know not always you felt the pressure you know when gilbert lacoz was the chef so eric repaired to me it was just another gilbert lacoz you know i'm just gonna meet this guy and we're gonna be you know, yeah fine we'll be professional and that'll be it we became such good friends he's such a sweetheart he's Amazing sense of humor, a, a kind human being. It just goes on and on. So, yeah, Eric's a great guy. I like Eric a lot. Yeah, but we were the trio in there for a little while there. You got Esco, uh -uh. you got Esco over here serving like straight up delicious, you know, local food. It doesn't get much more local than what you were delivering. La Bernard Dan, the French restaurant, fancy, got all the money, all the place, setting in the right place. And then Oceana in the townhouse, not, not shabby at all. But I'm doing my Americanized version of it all. And we help to raise the bar collectively, you know, I would say. Oh, come on, man. I mean, give yourself a little credit. I mean, you, you know, you were a trailblazer. <laughs> well, it was a lot of, you know, I had to swim with the sharks, man. And we pushed each other. And that's the beauty of it, you know. In the, in the end of the story is it was just, a, it, was, um, it was New York. It was, that, it was New York. You know, and we're all in the seafood business. We're all seeing each other in Fulton Market from time to time. Yeah, the fish market was downtown. You go yeah, at night. Yeah. You know, you go to the Paris and have a beer or two after being in the market. It was, exactly. you know, I would, it was classic. I would drag, I'd get externs from the Culinary Institute of America. You know, on their first night, I'd say, look, um, you meet me back in front of the restaurant at 2 a.m. You're going to the market. You know, I'd stuff an oyster knife in my back pocket and walk him into the market. And, you know, he's not realizing if you step in those puddles, your feet are going to stink like fish. So we go in there and I'll pop an oyster for him and make him eat it at three o'clock in the morning. Like, come on, that's what we do. Popping an oyster, you know, or doing something crazy. I just drag him through it because I wanted to make sure they understood 
where it comes from. What and, and you know, yeah. you're going to get run over by a by a forklift, or you're, you're going to be talking to Wilkinson down there for swordfish, or you know, Blue Ribbon. You're talking to David. You're talking to Will. You know, you're over at Smitty's watching them fillet uh, flounder or fl every flatfish that exactly they over at Smitty's. Yeah. The good old days. Yeah, and then you always had Slavin, and Slavin you dealt with because he was so big. He had fish that you know were on the on the verge of rotten that he was serving to not to restaurants, but he had a market for everything. So he was on he was he was working all the angles. You could get good fishing too. Herbie stood in that same spot for so long he wore a hole in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no Fulton market days and um, the realities of it. You know, we knew we knew that if you said the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong but time. But I think you know when they, when they moved the market, they they changed the culinary scene forever. No, you know, it got because, castrated. It got castrated when it left when it left uh, uh, New York. You know, the, you know, because like it was a market for the people, and the chefs could go, and it was easy to get to. It was in the middle of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. No, you actually saw like mostly Asian ladies walking around with those bags. Those little uh, paper, the large paper bags that, you know, had something else in it. I don't know. And they're dropping fish and they're rolling it up and bringing it home. You know, they, that, that really? took a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but so, oh, now nothing. we're in the, uh, we're in the coronavirus syndrome. Yeah. So, um, okay. So well, you, you opened up in 2000, Eska, after working in all these restaurants, continuously connecting with the ocean. Did, it wasn't like you used to go fishing, David. You've always fished, right? Was there ever a time in your life you didn't fish? No, I fished all. I fished all. I've, I've had the privilege to fish all over the world. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, like when I was a kid, I used to go with my dad. And, you know, we'd fish off people's docks. Sometimes we'd go on a boat. We'd fish a lot on the head boats, you know, the party boats. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you learn how to be a good fisherman. If you want to really, if you want to catch on a head boat, you got to learn how to be, you got to learn how to fish. I, I learned, you know, I learned in Cap Tree in Three Point. Exactly. I mean, you know, I would go on Captain Al's ship. He's screaming at everybody because, 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 you know, when bluefish hit, lines are crossed and people got birds' nets because they didn't, they weren't ready for the hot, the strike of a bluefish. And he's screaming at you. If you can't catch him, you can't cook him. Let's go, people. Yell, go over, over. He's yelling. He's create, he's choreographing those boats. They were insane. But how much fun that was, you know? Oh, it was great, you know. And then we were like, you know, we would flounder fish, and you know. And then like, I was fishing with all these other people, and my dad kind of stopped. And then like, when my dad got older, I introduced him to the, all these other people. And now, then he started fishing with them, and they were like the oldest seven. You had to be over seventy-five, and you had to be a pirate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would take my dad out on my boat. And I'd be like, Dad, you got to throw it back. It's too small. What do you mean it's too small? We could keep that. Look how beautiful that is. I'm like, Dad, you got to throw it back. What, and you throw it in the cooler. And I would open the cooler up and I would throw it back over. He'd be like, what are you doing? It's dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shit. So, um, do you want to talk? Because, you know, now that you know and I know, there's a rule and there's a regulation for everything. Well, you got to respect it, though. Uh, 100%. I, I, I fully agree with, you know, the regulations aren't tight enough sometimes and, you know, and sometimes they just don't seem to make sense, you know, the fricata. But, uh, you know, you, you, got, you got to know that if you don't follow them, you know, you might be hosing yourself in the future, you know, and, and nobody needs that. No, no, mo, mo, you know, listen, like, I would tell you, I had the best year of fluke fishing I ever had in my life last summer, mm -hmm. you know. And, I mean, regulations, there was a lot of fish around, you know. Yeah. And, you know, the, the striped bass fishing in the fall was unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it was epic. And, you know, I didn't do a lot of black fishing. I was in transition. I sold my old boat because mm -hmm. it was falling apart. So I really couldn't run it out in the ocean. I bought a new boat. And it was delayed because of the coronavirus. They couldn't get materials to finish it. Right. So I couldn't really run out in the ocean that much because, you know, I might have been swimming home. <laughs> yeah not a good idea but, you know and the, the guy said like i didn't do a lot but the, the guy said the black fishing was the best it's been in 25 years yeah that's awesome 
So, uh, so you got, you know, it's that passion and connection that like we've so much appreciated Eska. Do you want to talk about the, uh, uh the, the Batali Bastianish, uh, relationship scenario? Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, sure. You know, I mean, I was in business with, uh, Mario Batali and Joe Bastianich for, you know, basically 19 years. How many times you did you know? see Mario in the restaurant? Honestly. You know, you know, I don't really speak to either one of them that much. Joe, every once in a while, reaches out. Mario, every once in a while, shoots me a text. You know, mm-hmm. he seems like pretty happily living in Michigan. And, you know, Joe is Joe. Right, right, yeah. But, so, you know, we, listen, we, we, we were trailblazers in what we did. You know, we brought a different level of, you know, fish people never heard of. It was just, it wasn't just salmon tuna anymore, you know, and we brought, you know, white wines, Pagato and Vermitino and, you know, all these things that nobody heard of before, yeah. you know, there were people were using them here and there, but it was, we made them everyday names. Well, you also showed people how amazing it is with seafood, really, you know, those, yeah. those are, those are made for yeah. You could drink red wine with seafood. Just have to have the right red wine. That's right. Yeah. You know? And, and um, so, what happened? What happened towards the end there? I mean, well, you know, Mario had his problems, you know, with the Me Too movement, and you know, Joe became a celebrity. He just didn't want to really be in restaurants anymore. So the opportunity came, and it brought him out. And uh, you know, it was working out good until. Uh, you know, March of 2020. Pandemic. Pandemic. And you're not, you're not going to find a, a landlord in New York that's going to go, look, we really understand that you've been a great client for, uh, you know, since 2000 here. You know, uh, you've always paid on time. You know, maybe, yeah. we, we, maybe we had that one time in 2008 when we had the recession, but you still made good on your, your money, you know. And uh, you, you, I'm, I'm creating the fantasy discussion you'd want to have with a landlord. But what the heck, man? They just, they just felt what it, they're squeezing you. You know, it seems like, like my friends who like had small landlords yeah. were able to make agreements with the landlords. So like reasonable, like my landlord was a large, he's a very big landlord. Oh. And, you know, they just weren't cutting you. You know, they don't want to play ball. You know, you can't be open to lose money to support the landlord. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. Because you know? if, if they do it for you, then they've got a lot more people that are looking over the over the fence of what's going on around them, and they're going to demand the same thing. And they think they, they they make the decision not to give it to anyone. Otherwise, they're going to have to give it to everyone. That's their that's their fear. I think that's the way I look that, at it. That is their fear. You know, I mean, I always thought you know maybe they get a tax break, but people tell me they don't really get a tax break. So I don't know. You think something would be better than nothing? That's all right, man. I shut a rest- I shut my restaurant, two restaurants down in Mandalay Bay over two years ago, and they're still dark. Uh, whatever, this is all good. I'm they don't happy. care. I'm a, I, I'm a happy man. I know. I know the feeling. Good. It's not like because you and I grew up on and, and okay, back to seafood. The whole thing about the seafood is the relationships with your with your with, with your sources. Talking oh, to cool. him directly. Talking to Rod Mitchell, for instance. You know, Rod is, John is, he, he's, the, he's the king of seafood. He's the best distributor available. He's someone you know you can trust. Everybody with the greatest names from Charlie Trotter on down and over and sideways and above were buying from Rod Mitchell. You know, and he started out with some scallops because of Jean-Louis Paladin. But, you know, you can talk to him about anything and he'll watch out for you. He's the kind of guy that'll call you up and go, holy smokes. It's got something crazy and I've never seen before. You might be interested in trying it out. It's, it's, it's relationships that, um, that, that I miss the most, I guess, because I'm, I'm, I'm in a different place in my world. But the, the connectiveness I can have with this podcast and talking to people like you um, hits a part of me that gets me excited again about it all. You know, it's pretty cool because I used to be more embedded in it. Yeah, he, I mean, he texted me the other day. He's down to Florida fishing. Yeah, he's, you know, he texts me a picture of a cooler full of snappers, and he's holding two big snappers and a harpoon in the side of a swordfish. <laughs> oh man, see, you know, he's he's, he's got real. the same blood as me. <laughs> he does, and he's got to share it with. Look at I got it. 
hey, look what I got. You got to keep, you know, trying to show the other guy that you you got you're uh, you're in the game. You but know. you know, like I was in Portugal with Rod, and uh, we went to this really interesting restaurant that like he knew the guy in in Lisbon, and like their specialty was like. Uh, Oh, what's that fish uh, uh, that lives on the other fish and like sucks its blood out the of it? Lamp lamprey. It, their specialty was lamprey, and, like you can see there, like the blood sauce. Okay, yeah. okay, this is getting deep. Oh, dude, it was it was intense, but it was actually it was a very cool meal that we ate at this one particular place. You know, they just put a little plate of that on the middle of the table. I was like, all right, uh, you know, it gets a little, gets a little funky. Get on, get on the leeches, <laughs> this ocean leeches. That's well, you were in Norway, you know, they eat all that fermented stuff, and <sighs> man, oh. some of it's nasty. No, the first thing in my mouth at the first reception, and Eric Repair's there, and John Mariani's there, and yeah, on and on. Um, so it's it's a big platter, and it's whale. Whale, whale meat, which I'd never had in my life, never really was sure if I wanted to ever taste it. And they made it brajol style. It's dried, it's air dried whale. And I'm, you know, I, I got to try it. It's right there. What's this is an opportunity of a lifetime. After. In the mouth it goes. Thanks God. Thank God we're on a dock, you know, as, as, as for the reception. And I got to walk over and go, look at these great fish swimming down there. Pleh. Just plop out of the mouth. I could swallow it. You yeah, know, I tasted it. I was in the Faroe Islands and it was the same thing. It was, uh, I had fermented and air dried. The fermented was palatable. The air dried, it tasted like rotten fish, man. I mean, it was, it was tough. Oh, I've, in, in Alaska, in Imonic, Alaska, I've tasted seal, the, the seal oil. It gets really stinky, stinky. It's some, some, that's another acquired taste, seal. No. No, yeah. it'll never be on my menu. I promise you that. But, you know, when you're in an area like Emonic, which is, you know, just north of where cannibalism was invented, you know, and it's the, the, the native Indians, you know, the, 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 they were all uh, an amazing culture. And I learned a lot about salmon up there and their interactions, their love affair with it. Are they uh, Inuits or they uh, like Inuits. Amabaskans? Inuits? No, they're Inuits, yes. And they, uh, they're, uh, unbelievable culture you know the, what they believe in the in their relationship with the uh with the environment as well as the barge that pulls up once a week and has bread and stuff on it for them but there's not a sidewalk there's no asphalt in the entire area it's all mud and you're in long boots and you and if it uh, gets flooded they just put the pallets down on top of the, the to get your walkways to your houses you know it was in, in in the survival of it all it was just really to me it was it was uh Truly, truly did you eat cooked food or you ate only raw food no no we cooked it i cooked it right. i was grilling stuff you know teach them how to grill not don't put don't put the salmon over the flames because you flare up because you know we're, we had king salmon you know i'm cooking with king salmon that's you know it's so fatty so what river what river were you guys fishing was it like uh wasn't the, the Columbia. Yukon or it was, the, it was uh i think it was the yukon the mighty Yukon, beautiful up there. Huh? I love Alaska. No, but that's you're up in uh, Arctic Circle land. You know, it's bright all wow. day. You know, and, and it was just we were we filmed a, a documentary on it. I won. We, I actually I won I won a beard award, not for be, not for best chef, but for the documentary mnemonic. With a, it was called Chefs of Field. It was pretty funny. You know, but that, that's not what, it, to me, I don't care about the awards and all that at the end of the day. It's about what we do, you know, and I know you, you are. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way. Know. You know, the, the awards are nice, but it's really much more about, you know, the customer and the relationship and the relationship with the fishermen and, you know, the relationship with the fish farmer. That's a new thing, you know, that's, you know, that's the future. That's that's not that's what's necessary, really. And this generation um, is really hungry for that. That's what's good, you know. Like I'm I'm all, I'm in my own generation. I'm a baby boomer. They call me a they call me a boomer, you know. So um, Papa Boomer here, you know, connects with the. I'm trying to find out how we can plug into what generation to pass on. What we've had the privilege of, you know, connecting to and being involved in. You know, because I feel a real obligation to that right now. You know, when you get to be 65 and stuff, you're like, I gotta, get, I gotta, I gotta move on this information. And uh, 
they seem to, they were hungry for it. They really want to know the stories behind things, you know, so. Yeah. Well, they like the story with it too. That's really important, you know, like, you know, like, you know, if the fish is farmed in, you know, Iceland, you know, they want to know what the story is behind it. And, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're definitely interested in all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So this is my segue into uh, talking with you a little bit about aquaculture. The name, uh, the sponsor of the of the, the podcast is Forever Oceans, and it's a, a startup company. They're coming out with a product uh, later this year called Kahala, which is amberjack. And um, I, I want to get you some samples for you to, to get your feedback on it. I love amberjack. Yeah, it's fun to catch too. Let me see. <laughs> of course, it is back <laughs> off. Let me finish my story here. No, and and. Uh, there's, um, they're doing things right though. You know, I've, I've really, uh, have long, I'm a long study on aquaculture. I've watched it go from uh, a time era where I don't blame anybody for saying it, that, that they wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. I, wouldn't, I, was, I was on that bandwagon, as a matter of fact. I was fighting it all I could until they started saying salmon was bad. And then I'm like, no, I fought that too. And then I found out, yeah, they're right. And so I had problems with farm raised Atlantic salmon, especially uh, farmed on the West Coast because they're non indigenous, yada, yada. You know, I was carrying this flag. We had these discussions. Oh, yeah, of course. And, 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 and um, so I, uh, Fast forward, I'm, you know, I'm now working with this company and, and bringing in that mentality and, and, out, and, and I get to work with them. So I feel like the Trojan chef helping to formulate their, 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 their the fine dining, the polishing parts. The, the fish has to have nutrition, texture and flavor. It, otherwise, it doesn't matter how pretty it is. I don't want pretty fish from a farm that the fish didn't really live the way it needed to in order to get the things that make us, that turns us on as chefs, flavor, texture, and, you know, and I worked with uh, the, the, the product there, uh, the Kahala, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and it was, a, it was a pleasure to put my knife to it. I think you're going to like it. Where is the farm? Um, the, 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 uh, from Hawaii. So, you know, they have oh. uh, land-based um, hatcheries, and they bring it out about nine mi miles offshore in uh, the waters at perfect temperature for them to uh, feed on their own, you know, with their own, you know, cycles of hunger, you know, and the pellets are given uh, robotically. So it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's really efficient because they've got, they got monitors and everything. It's real high tech and they can move the pods up and down depending on weather. So there's not, there's, there's no escape issues. So they've handled a lot of things properly and the feed is, uh, is really um, coming from sources that are, are, are very sustainable. So, that all That's being said, important. you know, what is your feeling on aquaculture other than what I just talked to you about? I mean, you, you know, I know you're a purist. You know, you don't even have a freezer in your, in your refrigerator. And, and, and I believe your refrigerator, your freezer was the size of a, a you know, one you'd have in your home. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I didn't freeze anything. But I mean, you know, Rick, I think that you have to embrace the aquaculture because as we said earlier, it really is the future. And I think that the product has come a really a long way. You know, let's take like the Gia Island halibut, okay? Because it's a great example. Yeah. So when they first came to the market, the guy used to sell me one pound whole halibuts. And I used to roast them whole. Now they have fish up to 50, 60 pounds. And the quality is, you know, Sometimes it's better than the wild stuff. Yeah. You know, it's really like the product is really progressed. You know, my brother, my oldest brother lived up in New Hampshire and his neighbor was fish farming in New Hampshire, fluke, fluke. and sea bass. And he was shipping almost all of it to Japan. And the product was spectacular. Was it the hybrid sea bass? I remember the, the no, black sea bass. Oh, really? Black sea bass. Black sea bass. These are deep sea, deep water fish. How do they, I, don't, I got many questions. How they did that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, the, and you know, his market was ninety nine percent Japanese. Yeah, yeah. America doesn't see. We import so much fish; it makes me want to throw up in my mouth. You know. Yeah. But we don't really have an aquaculture environment here yet you know it's it's kind of sad there's a few guys doing it here a few guys doing it there but you know you go to scotland you go to iceland you go to faroe islands you go to hawaii there's a lot going on yeah, yeah. greece malta yeah but 
salmon is the number one selling fin fish, fin fish in the world. And me yes. growing up in Queens, you know, uh, my father liked to go fishing and that's how I got to go out on the waters. And it was always exciting for me. Like I couldn't wait to wake up. It's still dark out and go out with my dad in the car and go and fishing. But, um, salmon was uh, at farm raised Atlantic. We didn't, my parents didn't find any, there was no wild salmon available. I was imagining. I mean, I wasn't like I was paying attention to how my mother had to shop at that time, but every Friday we ate fish cause it was a Catholic environment. My mother was, you know, extremely religious and, and we had to follow the rules. Otherwise, you know, obviously we're going to hell. So, um, salmon was on the menu quite often, you know, and it was always farm raised Atlantic salmon. So that became my benchmark. So as a chef and my career and tasting other fish, and when we get Columbia river King salmon, it would, it would fly into New York. It was like, uh, this, the French celebrating the Beaujolais Nouveau arriving. It's yeah. holiday. You know, it was, it was exciting for me. But, you know, most of that wild salmon, though, was unaffordable to the average person. Uh -huh. exactly. You know, especially right now. I mean, right now, the price is crazy, crazy, you know. And uh, so that's why I think aquaculture is important. You know, it, it, it can bring fish to the table to the average person. And good quality. Oh yeah, so the uh, the kahala. I mean, it was it's it was amazing raw. It was truly amazing raw, you know. And I and I did and of course every time I handle a raw fish like that that I'm going to put out, you could you could call it Asian, but it's always Pastor Nakian. I made that word up. <laughs> it is, man. You you you, you, uh, you figured it out, man. I'm like immediately had to get like every olive oil made in the world when I left you. I'm like I'm going to taste them all. <laughs> Actually, I used to work with Owen Co. And I used to taste a lot of olive oils. And they, they really have, pe people think olive oil is olive oil. And they think, oh, shh. Then they read an article that realize, nah, not, all, not all extra virgin olive oils are the same. So they go and they buy, okay, they, they just picked the most expensive bottles figure and they figured it out. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a long study. And you um, demystified a lot of it for, for, for many people with your applications of bringing, you know, this fish is good, but it needs a little more fat. It definitely needs salt. It needs some acid and yeah, maybe a finger lime. Just pull a few eggs yeah. out of the finger lime, put it on it. You know, I, That's I learned, the you're, the, you're the man I learned it from. You know, that, that was the game, you know, you know, it's always that you need to add that one little thing. But that's, you know, you never, add every too once much. in a while you get a piece of fish and you say, okay, you know, you can you taste it raw, but then you taste it with a little salt, a little lemon, a little olive oil, and it's like wow, it just exactly. it explodes, man! Yeah. It like comes alive. Exactly, that's that's how I because when I get a fish in front of me, I've never seen before, and I'll tell you, every time I went to the fish market, I saw something. I had to ask, what is that? You know, still to this day, I go. I was there. Were, I went to the market last last week or two weeks ago. I was at the Fulton Fish Market, and then, you know, we cut a. We caught a 500-pound bluefin tuna, and the, there was a Japanese grader there. This guy Nobu, yeah. a different Nobu, but yeah. and I mean, basically, we stood there for 20 minutes eating, scraping the the, the carcass, <laughs> eating around where the collar was, <laughs> in the middle of the market. You know, three o'clock in the morning. Do you carry salt in your pocket, or is a little soy or anything when you go to the nah, market? No, maybe I should have. Yeah, it would be maybe nice. next time you should bring out some ponzu. You'd be, you'd be, you'd be like, oh my god, Jesus! You'd be, the Lord has arrived. <laughs> it was good though. The the piece that came right from behind the collar. Yeah, yeah I know like, exactly super, the one you mean. Super greasy and fatty. It was really yeah. good. Oh, you know, you don't forget that taste. No, no, you can't. It's wild. You know? It's it's the last carnivores that we really consume. Is the you know global. pretty much and. It's just a weird thought, you know, and, you know, I mean, like, you know, I'm going to put my boat in the water probably next week. And the first thing I'll do is go clamming. My first trip would definitely be going clamming, go dig some little decks and some cherry stones and make a bowl of linguine with clam. Nothing, nothing gets better than that. And this time of year, the beets are like, you know, to get that fat with that orange color to them. Yeah. yeah. And they're delicious. <laughs> 
I got to come visit you, man, sometime. I'd love to hang out with you. I'd love to get in the boat with you. I want to go fishing with you. We got to we got to get somebody to document because it's uh, it's it'll be it'll be uh, two characters just having a good time. And it would be fun. I have a funny feeling you're gonna bust my balls on. Listen, it's, you should you know. come in the spring. The, the spring bite for the striped bass is gonna be really good. With you. What do you use? Eels? You go with eel? I use I use everything. I use artificial. I throw a little rubber shads at them. I use eels. I use bunkers. I use spoons. I use pork rind. I use bucktail. All kinds of stuff. I'm not going to question a damn thing because I use one thing, and if it works, I'm happy. So all I can tell you. But the one thing about going after stripers is they don't have teeth, so you know you have to know when to set the hook because they, they might just be sucking on the end of your 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 bait and they haven't quite oh, yeah. gotten deep in it. How do how do you how, what how, what's the feel? Do you wait for the second nibble before you give it a yank? Is that how you hook them? It, it depends with the bait. Usually, I let them run a little bit. Yeah. Because, you know, I fish a lot of live bait, so they have to actually swallow it. The striper needs to swallow the bait head first. Exactly. Right. So Wh Wherever the hook is set. And if they're, tip if they're dangling on the tips and the ends of a, of a squid or something, you're, you, you just, you're not going to get them. But, you know, to me, I, if, you, if you put on the table a striped bass and a bluefish, I, I eat the bluefish any day over the striped bass, and it makes the best ceviche in the world. Tell me about bluefish, man. Break it down. We all know bluefish, you know, and for those that don't, let's bring them into this discussion a little better. This is a fish that you go after because it's one of the most exciting fish in the world to go fishing for. It doesn't matter what you throw in the bait. When they're striking, they're striking anything. You can throw out a diamond jig. You can throw out a beer can with bait in it, I think you said once. They'll bite in through the beer, the beer yep. can. So, I mean, they're biting, they're biting each other. You might pull up a head sometimes because it's either a shark or something because it's, it becomes this, this vicious boiling water, uh, silver, and, and big. I mean, we're talking like 12, 15-pound fish, at least when I'm back there. So, you know, it's no little thing. So when they see yours and they strike it, you better have your finger on the spool. Otherwise, it, you're going to have a fish net. It's just going to be So you pull these blue fish in. It's great. You take them off and you're happy. They got teeth. Watch out. They're snappers. And you, you, you put them on ice. You take them home. And if you don't cook, we always knew, if you didn't cook them that day, you know, my father would take aluminum foil, put them out. We take it the bloodline, rig dark blood dime down the middle, remove it. That probably get thrown out, and then we season it with lots of garlic and tomato, and you know, like real tomatoes, not tomato sauce or anything, but lots of garlic and olive oil and seasoned salt and pepper. Wrapped it up like a papillote on top of the grill. Yeah. That's how we ate it, and that's how I knew bluefish. And you know, you'd flake them out, and you see those little lines going through the flake, and you just ate them, oh, melted in your it's mouth. Like the, to me, the best bluefish you catch here in two feet of water. When they're in the shallow mm -hmm. and they're like feeding on like spearing or, you know, whatever's in the flats and you're just sight casting and you see them, they're popping up on the surface and you take them and you bleed them right away and then you scale them, you grow them whole, have great skin. Or like I was saying, ceviche, it makes the best ceviche. It turns snowy white. Yeah, yeah, of course, immediately. Uh, yeah, yeah, when they see that, once that darker skin sees acid, it turns white. And, you know, like people always say, you know, bluefish ceviche is like, just try it. Trust me. I got to do that. Well, I don't get a lot. Of, I don't get my hands on a lot. Of, by the time I get bluefish sent to me in Las Vegas, uh, the tick tock, yeah. tick tock. It just it doesn't, it's, it's, it's no good. No, nah, you got it. You're it, you get it out of the water, and you got something to do immediately that day, pal. <laughs> I only eat it if I catch it. Yeah, I that's like that. one of the fish. Like I'll only eat if I catch. Absolutely, throw it back. Otherwise, you know, have fun, but uh, don't. Yeah, I throw it back a lot. You know, I mean, like I'm, they're around already. I I see the birds up in the shallows. With the smallest snapper blues or the full size? No, what the cocktails? Like you know, two three pounders. Oh, those are cool. You go out there with your ultra light and you throw a small little diamond jig at them, lights out. Now, do you uh, do you fly fish or do you, you roll uh, rod and reel? What's that? Do you go fly fishing or are you more rod and reel? No, I'm a rod and reel, but I fish with a lot of light tackle. Gotcha. You know, my neighbor's a big fly fisherman and he does very well. He catches a lot, you know, 
He catches a lot of bass, a lot of bluefish. You see uh, bonita, false albacore. You know Kerry Heffernan, Chef Kerry oh, Heffernan? Course. Yeah, he's a big fly fisherman. He fly fishes for bluefish, you know, but I don't know how they how they how they pull that off. <laughs> I used to take him flounder fishing. And when we'd come back, my wife would say, Oh, you were out fishing with senior spaghetti because the the line was always tangled up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is perfect. I because we, we're talking. He and I are going to have a podcast coming up soon. So I'm a senior spaghetti. I got to write that down. <laughs> I'll remember. You're the best man. So what's next for you? What are you? What's going on? What's going on? Uh, you know, you still got some stuff going on. What? And, 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 you know, the answer could be is I don't care right now and I don't have a clue, but what is it? I mean, I'm working on some internet projects to do some seafood stuff over the internet. You know, I've been looking at some restaurant spaces. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm taking it slow. I'm in no hurry. Be honest with you. Manhattan or no Manhattan? Are you finished with Manhattan? Manhattan. That's all I know. You know, what am I going to do? Get up and go move to Florida and... No. Open up. I, I, you know, somebody said, oh, you should go to Miami. I said, I don't wear fancy enough shoes. I mean, would you open up in the Hamptons, the Hamptons or anything? It's tough. I mean, it's seasonal, you know. It's yeah. very, I, I mean, yeah. you know, it seems like, I mean, all the guys did very well last year. But, you know, last year was kind of a crazy year. You yeah. know, people had nowhere to go. No, they, they stayed at their houses. Yeah, yeah. That was good. Captive audience. You know, no. I'm looking at I'm looking at Manhattan. I'm looking, you know, there's a lot of uh, turnkey operations available, so that's no. really kind of what I'm looking at. There's plenty available. You just got to get plenty the right uh, get the right realtor. Don't get some exactly. hose, don't get some hose bag that's trying to just push something on you. You know what? You're smart enough. You connect enough. You go in if it feels right, it's right. If it doesn't feel right, don't talk yourself into it. I walk away. I, I walk. I turn around and go the other way. Yeah, right on. Perfect. That's what you got to no. do. Yeah, no. I, I gotta, I gotta get me some, uh, some uh, David Pasternak uh, prepared seafood soon in my life. I miss, <laughs> I, I miss it more than ever. Now, every chef I know, every chef in the seafood business, they come to New York. They come to see you. You've met them all. You've had to. They all do come. I, I had a lot of come over a lot of time. Yeah, and you, you know. are insane about sharp knives, aren't you? Uh, what was that? You are insane about sharp knives. I always have sharp knives. I'm a professional. <laughs> you are, man. <laughs> I love you, man. You're the best. You've taken up a bunch of your time. What else, man? You got anything else going on in your life you want to talk about? That's it. You know what I mean? You know, I'm excited for, you know, for the fishing season and, you know, for the spring to come. And, you know, that, other than that, Really, nothing too exciting, you know. All right, I'll ask you another said, question. I'm working on this internet project with like fish entertainment and cooking, and you'd be able to buy fish. And so that's coming. That's coming soon. That's great. You still it's selling your book? It's the future. Yeah, a hundred percent. You got to roll with it. That's what I'm doing. This podcast. I never in my entire life would think this would be something that uh, was important to me, but now it's becoming more important. You know, I'm pretty new at it at the moment. I'm trying to get better, but. I get to connect with people and like on a, on a different level, and we keep in touch afterwards. It's nice. We're gonna get you some fish out. You just let us know where. Send it out to your house. You know, you'll get you a couple of uh, fresh kahala salmon. From, no problem. I'll send you. I'll send you, I'll send you my uh, kahalas from uh, from uh, Hawaii. Are they doing other product, or are they just doing the? Uh, oh, yeah, this is now. this is their opening. Uh, you know, holy smokes, time. You know, let's find out if this is going to be a viable business. Because the investors stand on the sidelines waiting for other people that have put their heart and soul into it. You know, this guy Jason, 13 years, he's been working on this project. This isn't some harebrained scheme. It's just coming to fruition. And so the investors are waiting to see, okay, how's this do? Oh, okay, you can have an extra here. Whatever, you know how it works, how business gets trickled in from people that don't exactly understand what you're doing. So they want to see that it becomes a viable business. And so it's 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 all great stuff. You know, it, it, it's... I'm not worried about it. We got there's an amazing uh, infrastructure right now. I love I love the crew. I love working with them. I really believe in it, and I can't wait to get your feedback. On That's it. cool. Yeah, man. So 
you know. I and when you try it, if you do like you know, do a recipe on it, or you don't have to write out a recipe. You can do whatever. Do a, have somebody hold your camera while you're opening it up and talk about wow. Or I'll post some pictures and I'll do some yeah. crude oil and yeah, well, there you I'll go. do a little oh. olive oil poached amber jack. Oh, you, you're gonna hold this is yeah okay right up your right up your rally. Love to see it with, with, with how you handle it, man. That'd be that's gonna be exciting for sure. Well, you know what. Uh, on behalf of uh, all the listeners of uh, Ocean Rays, I thank you and uh, David Pasternak, uh, the, the real deal man. He's he's uh, it's, you know listen to him. It's just everything's coming from his heart. You know, he doesn't make stuff up. He's a uh, he's a uh, pioneer and remains to be. And I look forward to seeing another one of your places open up in New York. Uh, I don't get to New York as much as I used to, but you was always you were always a reason that I I, I came. Well, when you're going to be in New York, let me know. I'd love to take you out fishing, Rick. It would be my pleasure, my honor. We would have a great day. I we could eat some bologna sandwiches and have some good laughs. Oh, man. Don't get me going. <laughs> you're killing me. Love you, brother. Take it easy, huh? All right. Be good. All right. Foreverocean.com.